eight years ago, I went into a room close to my studio where I was actually recording my first album. And I met two people that I really liked. I always heard about them, never met them. One was Sami Yusuf and the other was Cat Stevens. We sat across a table and we spoke for length. I found out later on, I sat across them and we spoke at length and we got to know each other rather well. One of the first thing I noticed was that they had a lot of problems just like any other ordinary person. They had issues they need to sort out. They had problems. They had problems in their lives that they needed to sort out and a lot of personal issues. I thought to myself, if these people are this ordinary despite their fame, then who am I? I didn't underestimate myself, but I always thought about it. Who am I? From the beginning, the question of fame fascinated me. How can I be famous? I thought to myself. And I thought that I wouldn't be famous for the wrong reasons. I mean, I memorize the Quran, I speak Arabic, I learn Turkish, I can read any book that I want to in my religious context. But I didn't think about many things. But the first, the, first, the first four things I noticed were ego, of course, symbolic immorality, and of course, loss of privacy. The third I'll come to in a bit. People lost their sense of privacy when they became famous. They were agitated by other people mainly because you know, they couldn't have time to themselves. They couldn't think clearly all the time because they felt if whatever they did or said, right, people would judge them for that. Now, people always feel that they have to be this kind of famous before they can impact change in their societies. I thought about it for some time and I actually came to the realization after a lot of study, I actually wrote a paper on this that you don't have to be famous. In fact, most of the greatest changes in our lives or in our times are made by not so insignificant but ordinary people, people like me and you. A good example was in 1955 when Rosa Parks stepped into a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. She was told to sit behind where black people were allocated seats. She refused. She said she was too tired for that. The bus driver shouted at her, but she refused. There was a problem, she got arrested, and she was sent to a prison to be held. That kick-started the 50s civil rights movement, which was spearheaded by, at that, at that time, an unknown person by the name of Martin Luther King. He had a dream. He was imagining things, but he didn't have the capacity, as he thought at that time, to change. He was actually forced into it. He, re he rejected the offer of heading the movement, but at the end he accepted, and they went on to do a lot of things together. My proposition is that change needs a spark. You never know what the spark is. It can be the most extraordinary thing, and it can be the most lame, ordinary thing. For the civil rights movement, it was just a lady being thrown out of the bus. The bus boycott started, and it went on until the full-fledged civil rights movement took part. Again, the spark can be anything ordinary. So many women were deprived of sitting where uh, white people sat. So many people were deprived of their basic human rights. Some of them were killed. It didn't start anything, but a, wo a single woman deprived of sitting where she wanted to sit actually kickstarted the movement. What I'm trying to say is you never know what kickstarts change. There is an issue of imagination and fixicity when it comes to change. Some people think that the status quo is entrenched. You don't need to fix anything. Just like my slide is having a time of its own, going up and down. Fixicity is, as one of the speakers said, that we have a fixed mindset. People that are creative enough to want change always imagine a better future. Like Martin Luther King, who had a dream. 
it could be that. Now, the status quo is entrenched and people feel that I'm not enough. There's so much happening. The bureaucracy is bigger than myself. How can I change anything? Well, you can. At least start by getting off Twitter and Facebook for a start. A lot of us are addicted to the social media, which sometimes I'd like to call the social mania. And I'm not detesting the fact, I'm not contesting the fact that great change can be done virtually. As we have seen from the previous speakers, a lot can be achieved from a virtual perspective. The virtual tide is immense. Just on change.org alone, about 336 million people have petitioned. They have changed lives. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the incessant unnecessary uses of the social media, like taking pictures and posting them for no reason. That's what I'm talking about. People that use social media to impact change can actually make great change. But even then, studies have shown that the greatest activists are those people who get up from their screens and head out. They head out and they refuse to be armchair activists. You can make a change if you improve your skill sets. A recent Gap poll said 70% of people cannot make changes mainly because they are addicted to the social media. Those 70% are in the Western Hemisphere. We don't know about us. So many times you sit across young people trying to talk about sophisticated things, things that matter, but their minds are elsewhere, chatting on their phones or looking at their statuses, sometimes other people's status. So I believe we can change if we can detach and act, if we become reasonably intellectual and educated to face the challenges of our society. I remember when I wanted to learn Arabic, it was a difficult one for me. But I was forced into doing it mainly because I saw the great trajectory ahead of me, the capacity that I can build, the immense manuscripts that I could access so my point is, we have to imagine the future beyond what we have right now. We have to be intellectually perceptive, right? And as my fellow uh, speakers said, we have to be technologically aware. Technological awareness does not mean technological addiction. And I'm not a Luddite. I've chosen for myself, as a matter of fact, to detach myself from all social media outlets and I've done it for across the 10 years. And in that period of time, I'm counting and I've read 780 books, some in Turkish, some in English, and some in, of course, Arabic. Different books spanning across different disciplines. And what I found there is a world of impossibility becoming greatly possible. I believe that if we believe in ourselves as young people, and are ready to detach and act and become sensible users of the social media and technology as a whole, we can achieve a great deal of uh, feat for ourselves and our country. Leaders are created when a bunch of people, mostly ordinary people, begin to feel a sense of uh, depravity wherever they leave, and they come together to act. Not sit together at cafes, reading status, posting pictures, so that they can become influencers. The term influencer for me is just another term for photogenic people, people that can look beautiful or handsome. The social media has pushed people to begin to feel that they have to look good to do good things. So you have what we call the followers phenomena, that if you don't have the large or the right amount of people following you, you're not important. I'd like to call your attention to the necessity for all young people to actually intellectualize, to open their minds, take challenges, go to places where people don't want to go, not because they can't go, but because they chose conveniently not to do so. I'll give you a good example of change. Greta Thunberg, which a lot of people have been criticizing is just a young girl who took on a challenge of climate change, is trying to change the perspectives of the world through different means. She's digitally aware, 
She has read a lot of literature and she's just a teenager. A young man from Australia is actually one of those people that I uh, admire. I can't pronounce his name, but you can Google him up because you have phones, right? A, a Indian name. He was one of those kids who actually played a part in trying to solve the problem of lung cancer and won the Google Prize for Science. A lot of teenagers are doing great work. Another teenager from Canada raised 17 million Canadian dollars to remove golf balls from the river. We have this kind of people around us, but they feel incapacitated mainly because they feel they're not famous enough, not realizing that famous people became famous by virtue of what they did. They didn't just wake up famous. So if you want to be famous for the wrong reasons, the world is your stage. But if you want to impact change, then you might be famous or sometimes infamous, but you can do great things. I would like to give a proposal, and I hope you people can take it on. I believe that you, all of the people in this room can take, up, take it upon themselves to not perhaps go off social media, but to re reduce their social media usage and read at least one, one book a month, starting from this month, Alhamdulillah, it's January. So by the end of the year, you might have read 12 books. Read those books from different disciplines, impact yourself with knowledge, and then you can face a realistic world that is not created by what you see out there, but your imagination and your skill sets. Without further ado, I would like to end my talk here, and I hope it has helped you and face the, uh, helped you to face the journey without the feeling of infamy uh, blistering your past. Thank you very much. Thank you.